Okay, so welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stuart Allen, and I am the uh, professor and head of the school, a school affectionately known by its acronym, JOMEC. The center aims to foster an, an inclusive community of interested people open to multiple interpretations of what constitutes media history. And of course, photography is a big part of that, as one might expect, given the center's name honoring Sir Tom Hopkinson, who was a distinguished British journalist. Were he with us today, I trust Sir Tom would share our pride in this opportunity to celebrate David Hearn's career, the two of them enjoying a close friendship for many years. I'm very pleased to announce David has kindly accepted our invitation to be a fellow associated with the Tom Hopkinson Center. In addition to everything else, this fellowship is in recognition of David's longstanding professional commitment to educational excellence and his inspiration by example for all of us. And you're all fully aware of his accomplishments in the field of photojournalism from um, documenting the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, a Budapest, uh, producing some of the defining images of the 1960s, um, whether they be of uh, Connery, O'Toole, Kane, Frimpton, um, uh, and others. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce David with his uh, disarmingly low-key uh, title for his lecture, Key Moments in 64 Years of Averting Malnutrition. So I will hand over to him now, and I'm sure, like me, you're very much looking forward to hearing uh, him speak and hearing him recollect his illustrious career. Looking particularly at the back, it seems to me that people don't really want to be talked to by their grandfather. Um, so I thought what would be more useful, particularly for the younger people, is if I explain my life through what I would call key moments, because you're all going to have key moments. There are going to be decisions you have to make as you go through your life, and sometimes they're very difficult decisions to make. And that's the sort of decision that you're going to have to make if you have ambitions and, and you want to be a working professional photographer and get the most fun out of it. So I decided to go into the Army straight from school, which I did. So I went there, and then almost instantly, I was asked to go to Santos. And I'd been there about a year, and I was in the officer's mess, and I suddenly picked up a magazine, a picked post uh, as a, uh, that night, and I started to cry. And the reason I cried was because of this picture. It's uh, a Russian army officer buying his wife a hat in a department store. So the first memory I had of the love between my father and my mother was the buying of a hat in Howells. I looked at this photograph and it emotionally affected me. And the more I thought about it over the next few days, the more I realized, isn't that extraordinary that a photograph can make you cry, it can make you laugh, it can make you angry, it can probably make you calm, it can have this extraordinary emotional impact on you. But not only that, it can counteract propaganda. And so the propaganda that I was getting from very sophisticated lecturers at Sandhurst, I believed the photograph more than the people that were teaching me. And I thought, this is extraordinary. I want a bit of that. And I think, I can do that. You know, I would enjoy that. I like the idea of photographing people loving each other, basically. And so I've never shot a picture in my life. So I bought a little folding camera, I still have it, a bellows camera, and this is the picture that, that I'm, I'm talking about. So I bought a little bellows camera and a book called the Photo, 
think it's called the Photo Guide to Photography. So it was a little book, and it told you that, you know, the front of a box, there was a hole which could be made bigger or smaller, and on top of it, there was something you could press, and it let the light through longer. Or and, and, and so I learned the basics of the technical side of photography. And, and because I was, here we go, because I was like this on the right hand side, roughly halfway, you'll see an amazing fit looking guy. Well, that's me, the, the army athletics team at that, that sort of time. And we were in Belgium, and, and the picture on the right is really the first picture that I took, reading my focal, focal guide as to how to get the camera the correct exposure and, and shooting on my folding. And I just loved it. I, I remember seeing the picture and thinking, hang on, that's, that reminds me of Belgium. And I liked that very much. And so I left the army and, and went up to London and started to work in, in Harrods, selling shirts, because I needed the money. And then every single weekend, uh, sorry, every single evening, I would go to the coffee bars and I started to shoot um, coffee bars because I don't drink and, and it, the painters tended to go to the uh, pubs and things and, and, and writers and people went to coffee bars. And so I just started to learn to look at things that I thought were interesting and I started to photograph with my little folding camera. What I discovered there was I met people, it was a kind of what we now call networking, and, and I met these people, and, and I discovered there were basically two groups of people. There were doers and talkers. And the doers tended to congregate together, and the doers tended to, uh, and the talkers tended to congregate together. And I found that trying to shoot pictures and, and, and showing them to people, the people that were the doers were interested. And you began to make friends. And, and so I was very lucky because Michael Foote was one of the people in the coffee, uh, at the coffee bar at that time. He was, I think he was editor of Tribune or something like that at the moment. But there was Colin Wilson, the writer, was there. And, and Judy Christie was there. She was, she was still at school, and Peter, Peter O'Toole, I, I, I met there, who was at RADA, and, and Stuart Holroyd. A whole lot of these people were doers. And, and they, they said they all knew it, know each other, you know. And then, as I said, there were the others that talked about what they were going to do tomorrow, um, and I suspect never, ever did it. So, conversation with these people, Ken Russell, for example, Ken Russell at the time that I met him was a ballet dancer. Um, uh, one learned so much from the ambition and the drive of, 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 of these people. And through Michael, M Michael was obviously the, the political person, was talking about hungry. Now, now the picture that I've got up here is a picture, again, taken with my little folding camera, which was the sort of pictures that I was taking in the coffee bars at that time. This, this is a picture, it's actually a, a plate glass window, and the people outside are looking to see if their friends are inside the coffee bar. When I look back on it, it it's actually, it's, it's a very sophisticated picture. I, I, I'm amazed that I could take this on my little folding camera. Anyway, Mike was talking about something, and, and, and I had another friend called John Antibus who went on and wrote The Bed Sitting Room with Spike Milligan and did a lot of goon shows, wrote a lot of goon shows. He wanted to be around. And through Michael, we decided that it, it would be a, a good trip to go to Hungary because there was this thing called the Hungarian, Hungarian Revolution or Uprising, whichever title you want to give it. Um, and so we decided to go and see what it was about. Now, the reality is very few people 
get there. You, you know, the very few people are, well, very few people are going to be Kudelka or, or Sergio or this. I know. So part of the trick is, is to, in a way, realize in your own mind that that's not the be all and end all in photography, it's being Cartier Bresson. You know, if you start off as being a painter and thinking, I'm a failure if I'm not Rembrandt, you're going to be a failure. You know, because there ain't going to be a, a Rembrandt. <coughs> but you can do whatever you do as well as it's possible for you to do. And that should be your ambition. You know, if you're going to be a commercial photographer, fine. I hate this sort of categorizing as though I am a so-and-so photographer. I, am, I continue to hear people say, young people say, I'm an artist. I have no idea what they're talking about. I really don't. I, I mean, I'm not being impolite. I don't understand. I understand what a plumber is. But I don't understand my local plumber, who is now calling himself an artist plumber. <laughs> um, now, I, what I do understand when I talk to him, and I say to him, why do you say that? He says, oh, because I get much more money. <laughs> That's an honorable thing. I understand what he's talking about, you, you know. But, you know, why is this group thinking they're more important than than somebody who takes wedding pictures, for example. I mean, the answer is if we know that if there's a fire in a house, it, they, they don't, the person in that house doesn't rush to get the Cartier Bresson print that they bought a long time off the wall. They, buy, they get the wedding album. Now that means something. You know, the wedding album to most people is the most important form of photography, etc. They do it well and realize that you're doing something which is very important to people. Do it well. Modern Magnum and how we've sort of shifted over the last 70 something years, um, we're still experimenting, still trying to you know, create um, a different platform for photographers to sustain themselves. Um, you know, it's no secret that uh, Magnum is a predominantly photojournalism agency uh, and the bottom falling out of the media industry in the way that it has done probably over the last 20 years, that and as the membership continues to expand, we have to find different ways of um, bringing Magnum photographers in, but then also helping them to sustain their, to sustain their work. Um, since David's donation in 2017, the museum has opened its first gallery dedicated to photography and developed an ambitious exhibition, learning and events programme. The David Hearn Collection forms the basis of our photographic collection in the art department and it has enabled us to be more ambitious and strategic with our collecting as opposed to the somewhat reactive approach we have taken previously. David talks of himself as a man of ideas. For me, it was a story of a storyteller. And the story was showing things as they are. And I think that is a really important takeaway message we've got. And in this case, it was showing things as they are, and I took down through a box with a hole in the front. Be that a Leica camera, be that a smartphone, it's still a box with a hole in the front. He's a storyteller, and he told stories. We really need to keep photojournalism alive, particularly in this current environment that we have at the moment. And going back to David again, telling things as they actually are. As David said, do it well. They did it well, and I'd like us all to thank them for it. <laughs>